So have a lot of you been going to these um, uh, behavioral neuroscience seminars um, that they have given? Uh, you know, yes, they've been great. Hopefully, yeah. they're, hopefully you just sort of get a sense of uh, a lot of the things that you're able to uh, either do or what's going on around you. It's always very good to learn what is going on around you. Okay, so we're right at about uh, uh, nine fifteen, and I don't. Uh, uh, I I would like to uh, keep going on. We're at twenty four. Up oh, here comes another person. So now there's twenty five people. Uh, they'll be joining. Um, and uh, okay, so one of the things that I'm going to do is at the end of the class. I'm going to go over a series of ideas I have for the exam because the material that I hope to have on that exam is going to be uh, hopefully all covered today. And what we can then do is discuss this, or I can actually have a number of you uh, 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 discuss things among yourselves and things like that. Uh, because what I want to do is I want to have the fairest and the, uh, the sort of best way and best practices of, of, uh, of doing this. Okay, so with that, I'm going to, uh, let's see, go and put everything on full screen. And then I'm now going to go to okay and And here we go. What we're going to be covering today are the spinal cord projection systems. And as you can see, we have uh, quite a number. Uh, let me just, yeah. Let me just go back to participants for a second and just see that everybody's been admitted. It looks good. Okay. All right. Um, so um, obviously in this slide, it shows you an enormous number of projection systems. And basically you have the idea as to how many of these uh, ascending and descending pathways are going all the way up into the brain or going all the way back down into the spinal cord. So what we're going to be doing is covering a, uh, a, a series of uh, obviously highly important ones. And then what I'm going to be uh, uh, putting in here today is um, uh, the newer feature of this course that I was asked to do. Of course, this course used to be known as Basic Neuroscience Neuroanatomy. And then uh, folks asked me, if I wouldn't mind uh, 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 changing it to basic neuroscience syst uh, systems neuroscience, which of course then goes beyond the scope of the neuroanatomy and goes into a lot of physiological and functional uh, situations. When I would teach it as pure neuroanatomy, of course I would uh, uh, sort of tie many things to brain behavior relationships functional, but here I'm going to be uh, uh, doing a, a bunch of uh, physiology as well. Uh, given the fact that it's such an, a large amount of information, uh, what I probably, uh, what I still do is on the exams, um, emphasize the neuroanatomical material that I just think is important. Okay, so uh, when we look at this, 
uh, what, uh, if you haven't figured out so far, but this is sort of a summary, is that as we've been going through the spinal cord, and even when we talked about gross neuroanatomy, uh, we were identifying particular ascending and descending systems. And of course, virtually all of these systems play very, very major roles in uh, somatosensory information, okay? So the ascending systems that we've talked about is the dorsal column and dorsal column postsynaptic systems, the anterior spinothalamic tract, the lateral spinothalamic tract, then the posterior and anterior spinocerebellar tracts. Now, in addition to all of those, because if you notice with the, uh, with the first three, what we're basically dealing with is uh, pathways that are going to go up to the thalamus and then be represented in various degrees up into the cortex, okay, uh, particularly the postcentral gyrus. Uh, then with the posterior and anterior spinocerebellar tracts, this is a pathway originating in the spinal cord and then going up into the cerebellar cortex. Now, of course, there were many other tracts, and one is called the spinoreticular tract, in which most of the um, most of the projections are going into from the spinal cord up to the either the medullary, pontine, or midbrain reticular formation. And I'm going to go in a lot more detail about what I mean by reticular formation in the coming lectures. Then there is the spinotectal tracts. And of course, what you're talking about here, when you see the word tectum, what you should automatically think about is that part of the brain in the midbrain that is superior to the uh, cerebral aqueduct. So there are projections from the spinal cord into the inferior colliculus and the superior colliculus. Then, of course, there are spino-spino tracts. And, of course, a major spino-spino tract that we have talked about is um, uh, the tract of the zone of Lissauer, which is basically axons of fibers uh, 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 of cells that are in a posterior marginal zone or lamina one of the spinal cord. We're just not going to spend that much time on spinal reticular, spinotect, on spino spino tracts. They're in the book and whatever. And again, you're not going to be very responsible on any exam. On the descending uh, systems, we have, of course, from the very first class, when I ident identified the precentral gyrus, and then we identified the internal capsule. Then we looked at the inferior surface of the brain, looking at the cerebral peduncles, looking at the pyramids. We were paying attention to the lateral and anterior corticospinal tracts. And of course, we'll go into more detail there. Now, the important thing here with the descending or motor system is uh, one of the things that you can basically look at is uh, basically the part of our body in which we are moving and we're palpating our environment and interacting with our, our environment. We mostly interact with our environment with our upper appendages. So one of the things that you can think about right here is you can think of uh, the part of the appendage that is very proximal to the uh, shoulder and then the arm. And then of course, then you have uh, the part of the appendages that have to do with the, um, with the uh, movements and, and the hands. So one of the things that's very clear is if you basically look at an arm movement and then a finger movement, what you can basically look at is on the one hand, a sort of gross movement going, which is uh, emanating from the shoulder. And then we can have 
the very fine movements, although I'm not a good exemplar of it, of using the fingers and just think of a, a, a great pianist who uh, can uh, you know, use their fingers with incredible dexterity and make ma magnificent music. And what's very interesting here is um, we can take the three major tracks that I have listed here, the lateral and anterior corticospinal tract, then the rubrospinal tract, and then the reticulospinal tract. And uh, so where is the reticulospinal tract originating? They're originating in these cells in the ventral midbrain, ventral pons, ventral medulla, going back down to the spinal cord. So, and, and if, you think of the, if you think of the reticulospinal tract for a minute, and you again think of the phylogeny that we have been covering as we move from simple organisms up the, uh, up the scale, uh, once there was began to be determined encephalic development, um, and, and that would be in something as simple as a planaria versus an earthworm, in which a certain amount of uh, information was seeded from the spinal cord ganglia towards this uh, head, so to speak. And basically, uh, the, uh, the most ancient of those cells would be this sort of primeval reticular formation that is sort of making uh, integrating types of movements. And the point of the matter uh, then is, um, is that the reticulospinal tract would then control movements uh, and synchronize and integrate those movements. Now, uh, the point is, you're basically thinking of, in very ways, gross movement. And of course, a whole bunch of studies, especially done between the 50s and the 70s, uh, did a magnificent single cell recording uh, up in the reticular formation and basically could identify, or when you stimulate, uh, the kinds of movements. And what kinds of movements do you get? What you get with the reticulospinal tract is these proximal types of movements. So they basically control um, what, uh, 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 you know, the sort of gross movement going forward and whatever. Now, we then go to the rubrospinal tract. So first of all, rubro, what, what, uh, what color comes to mind with you? What color comes to mind, I hope, is the red, is red. And there's an actual nucleus, a large nucleus found in the midbrain, and we'll be looking at that, called the red nucleus because it has the slightest pigment of reddishness, just like the substantia nigra has a, 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 a pigment of a, a dark pigment, okay? So this red nucleus, which is found in the middle of the midbrain to the rostral midbrain, obviously sort of came along phylogenetically later than a reticular formation. And very interestingly, what does the rubrospinal tract control? What it appears to control is these uh, distal types of movements, the movements of fingers and appendages and the hand. So if you basically think of it, you have two systems here a reticulospinal tract, which is doing the proximal gross movements, and then the rubrospinal tract, which is doing the fine movements. So what does that leave us? What that leaves us is a further elaboration of, uh, of the development of the nervous system as we move up the phylogenetic scale, when all of a sudden now, we now have a cortex and uh, very much the precentral gyrus and another group of associated secondary motor systems coming out of the cortex. Now, what basically, how do you basically add this? Well, you add this by doing, uh, by doing what? By literally integrating the proximal mo gross movements of the reticulospinal tract and the, uh, the, finer 
uh, distal movements with the fingers of the rubrospinal tract. So in a lot of ways, what you're going to basically see is a corticospinal tract that not only projects down into the spinal cord to exert effects on alpha and motor gamma, uh, alpha and gamma motor neurons, but in addition, there is a so-called cortico-bulbar, B-U-L-B-A-R tract that literally has uh, precentral gyrus synapses come down and synapse on the red nucleus and synapse through the reticular formation, either directly or indirectly, and modulate this. And probably the best, one of the most beautiful and elegant examples of this was a, a series of studies done over about a 25-year period by uh, a neurophysiologist at NIH named Malin, M-A-H-L-O-N, DeLong, D-E-L-O-N-G. And what DeLong studied were uh, primates. And uh, so what uh, these monkeys would basically uh, go and do would be trained to uh, uh, do a series of tasks. And uh, the, the tasks were, instead of having the key, computer keyboard in front of them, what they had was a series of different uh, depth wells that were um, carved into a, a wood board in which the monkey would have to do uh, a very close kind of uh, picking up of things or a reach. And then they not only would they have to reach and do things, what you would then have to do is you would have um, uh, shallow uh, grooves in the board in which it'd be rather easy to pluck a raisin out of that board and put it in their mouth. Or you would have uh, uh, these, uh, these depths that were deeper. So, uh, and, and, and all of that got mixed, whether it's proximal, whether it's lateral, whether it's distal, whether it's deep, whether, and so the, the, the monkey would do, the, uh, the, do these tasks. Now, again, the monkey would then have uh, a, a series of lesions. There could be a lesion of the reticulospinal tract, there could be a lesion of the rubrospinal tract, or there could be lesions of the corticospinal tracts. And what they basically, what basically would happen is based on the particular type of lesion, the animal started to show a deficit. And the most beautiful kind of thing is if you had an intact reticulospinal tract, which meant that the monkey could make these shoulder movements to do a large reach or a short reach, and they still had a rubrospinal tract where they could either uh, take the uh, take the um, the raisin out of a uh, a shallow groove versus make a good use of fingers to reach a raisin out of a deep groove, uh, these animals will uh, 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 be able uh, to still do that. The point of the matter is when you knocked out the corticospinal tract, that integration between reach and depth of grabbing um, all of a sudden got all screwed up. So you basically start to see um, uh, the sophistication and the ability uh, of the organism to exercise and use their motor system uh, among these three ways. And of course, there are then large uh, anatomical controls that we're going to go over when we uh, go into the brain as to how this uh, motor control uh, is affected. And of course, some of that especially with the reticulospinal tract, is one of the ways is the corticobulbar tract coming down from the cortex is now impacting uh, the, uh, uh, another system called the inferior olivary system, which of course affects the cerebellum, and then the cerebellum comes back down and then affects uh, all of the reticular neurons. So there's a very series of elaborate circuits that allow us 
to do what we basically talk about is highly coordinated behavior. And that when uh, you're not able to do those, that uh, 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 coordinated uh, behavior, you basically start to see all of the various classic types of motor deficits that a person may have with certain types of brain damage. So, uh, so what we're gonna be doing is looking at the dorsal column and dorsal column postsynaptic system, the anterior spinothalamic tract, the lateral spinothalamic tract, the posterior and anterior spinocerebella, and then we'd be looking at the lateral and anterior corticospinal, the rubrospinal, and a little bit about the, um, about the um, uh, reticulospinal. Okay, so um, here we, so now what we're gonna do is go back to a, um, uh, 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 looking at uh, the, the thalamus and cortex through two ascending parallel pathways. And then we're gonna be looking at the cerebellum. And uh, so the dorsal column medial and niscal system that we've been talking about, if you notice, again, it's fine tactile and proprioceptive information, A alpha and A beta types of fibers, and uh, terminating in the ipsilateral dorsal column in the brainstem. Okay, and we'll be going over all of that piece by piece. And then the spinothalamic tract either the lateral spinal thalamic tract, which is primarily carrying noxious or pain information, and then thermal and visceral information, mostly coming uh, through the anterior spinal thalamic tract. These are gonna be two very important, uh, uh, or three important pathways that we'd look at. And then what the, uh, in uh, this terminology, and like I always warn you, uh, the terminology is uh, it changes. So here we have what is called the dorsolateral tract. And of course, what they're really talking about there is the posterior spinocerebellar tract. And you can see that the posterior spinocerebellar tract is going from the lower half of the body, because if you remember the, uh, the columns of Clark that I pointed out were there from about L2 up to about C8. So it's the lower part of the body of ipsilateral information going to the cerebellum. We will also talk about the anterior, uh, the uh, and, and, and the uh, uh, the anterior cerebellar tract as well. So uh, this is a, 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 I think, a very nice little diagram because what it basically shows you is the fasciculus gracilis here and here, here and here and then the fasciculus cuneatus here and here, okay, in this upper cervical layer. And what you can basically see in this diagram is it basically shows you this somatotopic organization so that the fasciculus gracilis is carrying information from pretty much the lower limbs, S5, all the way up to T6, and the fasciculus cuneatus is carrying information from T5 all the way up to C1. And uh, so you sort of see that somatotopic organization. So again, when we're thinking of, um, of the organization of the somatosensory system, what are we basically always thinking about? We're thinking of that uh, 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 post-central gyrus, which has this homuncular, or a topographical map uh, 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 arrangement. And the reason why it's that way is because this is how the inputs were coming in via the spinal cord, not the other way around, okay? So uh, again, you see the dorsal and ventral horns uh, here. And then we see the major tracks of the lateral corticospinal tract, the uh, lateral spinothalamic tract, the anterior spinothalamic tract, and the anterior corticospinal tract. And then of course, some of the fibers, some of these systems 
have uh, a decussation, and that decussation happens where? It happens uh, at the level, uh, either at the level of the spinal cord you're in, or near the, the level of the spinal cord you're in. And of course, the three major tracks that I want you to remember that are decussating in the spinal cord across the anterior white commissure are the lateral spinothalamic tract, the anterior spinothalamic tract, and the anterior spinocerebellar tract. Okay. So, uh, so here we're starting to talk about this dorsal column system. And of course, the most important thing that we want to uh, 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 look at here is that if you remember, I basically said that there are two different types of uh, groups of fibers that typically enter into the dorsal root ganglion. And again, what is the dorsal root ganglion? It's a group of cells sitting outside each level of the spinal cord. And the cells really have no dendrites. They're basically all there together. And then basically what happens? Um, the uh, axon comes out and it bifurcates so that one goes out into the periphery where it's interacting with somatosensory receptors either in uh, the outer skin, the inner skin, the muscles, the tendons, the joints, etc. And then if that gets activated, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, axon has an action potential that shoots past this bifurcating period, uh, point and now enters the spinal cord. So those fibers that are large diameter fibers, which basically means what? They are heavily myelinated, usually A alpha and A beta. Those fibers are entering in uh, 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 medially and they basically go right into the dorsal column and then they ascend. Whereas the smaller diameter fibers, usually A delta or C fibers, enter uh, the spinal cord uh, laterally and go in synapse, usually anywhere from lamina one to lamina five. Okay, so uh, that's that. Okay. And so here, what we're looking at are these uh, are, are these uh, uh, fibers here, and what you can basically see is that there is some di division. That pain, temperature, and itch can be found very much in lamina one and two, and then lamina three and four are interneurons and mechanoreceptors, and then number five is wide dynamic range neurons. What you're basically going to find in a somatosensory system is that there, uh, uh, there, are, uh, there is an arrangement in which we respond not only just to one modality. They we can respond, this wide dynamic range or WDR neurons typically respond to a number of modalities. Uh, and what are the major three modalities that we worry about here? What we basically talk is mechanoreceptors. That is receptors that are responding to what we end up calling touch or some degree of pressure. Then thermoreceptors, which is responding to the local temperature that is in the skin, either cooling or warming. And then there is a third a uh, chemoreceptor in which you're responding to the chemical milieu in which uh, that, uh, 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 these receptors are found. And of course, this becomes very, very important when all of a sudden something happens that causes some degree of small injury. And then what you have is a whole bunch of immunological responses where you have a bunch of glial responses that literally change the milieu. And by changing the milieu, uh, they are releasing chemicals. So a classic kind of chemical 
that we basically can think of in this situation um, are kinin types of substances. And the one uh, kinin type of substance that is a, a classic one that basically shows some degree of irritation is if you were injected with bradykinin. And bradykinin can not only be found in the immunological milieu of, of, of an injury, but sometimes bradykinins can be found in various insects that end up biting you and, and you have a flare and things like that. So, so you can change your, um, uh, you can get somatosensory information in three ways. A classic pure mechanoreceptor, classic thermoreceptor, classic chemoreceptor, and then you can get what are called the wide dynamic range neurons in which you're, uh, you're getting a combination of these things. Now, then within those, within those different uh, now four groups, mechanoreceptors, thermoreceptors, chemoreceptors, or wide dynamic range neurons, we can divide them then into two different types of categories. One category is called a high threshold. So there can be a high threshold mechanoreceptor, a high threshold thermoreceptor, a high threshold chemoreceptor, or a high threshold wide dynamic range neuron. And what basically happens here neurophysiologically with those uh, high threshold types. They basically are quiescent. They are totally quiet until you reach some threshold that then uh, creates the action potential. So it's quiet, 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 beep, okay? Versus uh, uh, the uh, second type, which is a low threshold. And in the low threshold, what you're now doing is the, uh, the low threshold mechanoreceptors or thermoreceptors or chemoreceptors or wide dynamic range are, are firing much more frequently. And as the stimulus gets larger and larger, they fire higher and higher and higher. Now, the interesting thing about the somatosensory system is that if we pay attention to the fact that there is that there are mechanoreceptors, that there are thermoreceptors, and that there are chemoreceptors. What this very much follows is a, 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 an argument that was made all the way back in 1828 by the German uh, neuro, uh, scientist Mueller. Mueller posited uh, a law. Of course, way back in the 19th and early 20th centuries, people promulgated many laws, okay? And um, this law was the law of specific nerve energies. Now, this guy didn't know bupkis about what we know about today about the uh, brain or what was known in the early 20th century, 80 years thereafter. But he was incredibly prescient because the law of specific er nerve energies basically argued for these afferents, that these afferents are getting stimulated in very specific ways. So that if we go and we think of a, another uh, 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 sensory system like vision, we eventually discovered uh, rods and cones. Uh, that when you look at the auditory system, you discovered what? You discovered uh, hair cells. And then uh, when you looked at the olfactory system, you basically discovered a whole bunch of uh, highly specific receptors, almost a thousand according to Richard Axel, uh, that, uh, 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 that, that pick up particular scents. And then of course for taste receptors, you have the different receptors uh, uh, very clearly for five areas, um, uh, 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 sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. And of course, there's a sixth one 
that hasn't been identified yet, but people keep arguing about it, is fat. Uh, so in all of those, those would be label lines. But once we get into the somatosensory system, we seem to have um, uh, uh, these uh, mechanoreceptors, thermoreceptors, and then uh, chemoreceptors. But then the apple cart gets upset a little bit, especially when we go into these things called wide dynamic range neurons. Okay. So, all right. So now, uh, so here we are with our label line. Um, so the argument here is that um, pain is not the result of just overstimulation of general cutaneous receptors, but rather the activity transmitted by specific nociceptors. Uh, cold, cool, warm, heat arise from activation of separate temperature receptors. And then each sensory system contains subsystems that have uh, features or components. So uh, what, what you're seeing, where you're seeing it, is it moving and what is its color is all conveyed by different uh, pathways. And that a perception can be simulated by electrical stimulation along the pathway at the receptor or anywhere upstream of the receptor. And then the whole idea of uh, what's the difference between sensation and perception is that perception is a constructed representation of the stimulus at each uh, station along the pathway, and that we have the sensory cortex and the motor cortex working in that way. Now, again, uh, uh, obviously, everything I just said there is um, somewhat, um, has to be somewhat tempered. So, the somatosensory system actually covers three very major and diverse functions. One, uh, 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 the one we usually pay attention to most is exteroception. That is the sense of the external world through what? Uh, passive and active touch or pressure, thermal sensitivity, and then pain and nociception, which is uh, the pain, the nociceptive effect itself, and then any kind of chemoreceptive change that happens afterwards. However, in addition to exteroception, we also have in the somatosensory system proprioception. And proprioception is the sense of oneself in space. So you basically know whether you're sitting, standing, prone, etc. And the, re and the thing that you're getting there is lots of information that's coming from skeletal muscle. So we're talking about joints and tendons and the joints and the inner parts of the skin. And there is a conscious awareness of your posture and then any movements that you're making as you're getting uh, the extraceptive stimuli. So you have to put proprioception and exteroception together in order to make a very important kind of somatic motor response. Now, we are very, very aware of exteroceptive. We are less aware, that is, at least in our consciousness, of proprioception other than knowing, yeah, we're standing, sitting, and whatever, okay? The one that's the hardest is interoception, which is the sensing of internal functions. So basically, those chemoreceptors out in the skin or a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of receptors that are in our viscera, so that we're basically paying attention to our respiratory system, we're paying attention to our digestive system, etc. So it's a very interesting thing as to whether or not 
um, uh, 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 how we have basically done this when we think of consciousness. We pay very, very close attention to extraceptive stimuli. Then we pay a lot of attention to proprioceptive stimuli, and we probably pay the least amount of uh, uh, attention to et interoceptive stimuli, unless those interoceptive stimuli are now happening in a, in a point of either deprivation or privation. The basic loss of uh, air for a second, the basic uh, loss of nutrients, et cetera, that is basically um, all of a sudden going to uh, put things. Now, under normal circumstances, if you're doing what we're all doing right now, uh, uh, we're basically sitting in one place, although I'm gesticulating all over the place, um, uh, uh, you're just basically sitting there, you will have uh, not so much paying attention to proprioception, but uh, you'll pay a lot more attention to extraception. And then as I drone on and drone on and drone on through this, through this lecture, you might all of a sudden realize, oh, I really didn't eat very much for breakfast. And maybe at about 11 o'clock, interoceptive stimuli start to break in and affect the extraceptive stimuli that we're thinking about. But then there's a third thing. Let's go to that extraceptive stimulus like pain and nociception. And if pain and nociception is there because there is some type of predator trying to eat at our, uh, uh, our leg or something, what does that basically mean? It probably means that you're gonna have to change your location. So therefore, now all of a sudden, even though you might be in the presence of a high amount of pain, you may now switch into a much more important proprioceptive type of uh, thing and uh, basically trying to do an escape response and then you might even actually start monitoring et interoceptive stimuli to basically gauge at uh, your respiratory rate, your heart rate, that you don't wanna exert yourself to a point where you're gonna kill yourself and, and whatever. So uh, this is always very interesting because in this kind of thing, um, uh, this was probably one of my uh, first areas postdoctorally called stress-induced analgesia. That if uh, all of a sudden an animal or a human is placed in a high, highly stressful situation, basically what can happen is that this stressor can actually activate uh, endogenous pain inhibitory systems to shut off the pain and go on. And we'll talk about that as we go along. So it's important to know about all three of these systems in order to understand here. So here, uh, looking at here, the four major somatosensory modalities. So you have touch and you have all of the things there, proprioception and its partner, kinesthesis. So what is proprioception? It's considered primarily sensory. What is kinesthesis? It's considered primarily motor. So uh, in proprioception, you're looking at your muscle positions, whereas in kinesthesis, you're integrating movements. And then that, 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 those uh, movements are now producing proprioceptive stimuli that indicate the change in the muscle positions. So you're getting signals from the skin, muscles, tendons, joints, and the vestibular system. Then, of course, we have no susception uh, perceived as either pain or itch. And the idea of, and of course, it's always interesting that you put nociception together and that very often, if you have an itch, it indicates the uh, uh, presence of previous pain. And what's always interesting is what do you do to an itch? You might scratch it that might actually exacerbate the pain, but paradoxically it doesn't. 
And we have whole bunches of explanations of that, again, playing very important roles with the Kynans, uh, Brady Kynan, but then an, uh, a, a, a classic uh, peptide neurotransmitter called substance P that plays a role in that. And that specific receptors will modulate different types of pain. And then of course we have temperature. Uh, now, the whole idea then would be basically argue, well, if we have these somatosensory systems and we have a touch, a proprioception, kinesthetic, a nociceptive and a temperature, shouldn't they have separate labeled lines and distinct receptors and pathways. And the interesting thing here that you can see here in the bottom is that you have, you can have nociceptors, you can have mechanoreceptors, and you can have proprioreceptors, but what you can also have are, are receptors that are both nociceptive and mechanical, and that you can have mechanoreceptors that are also proprioceptive. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, the, the label line starts to break down. Plus, when we go out into the periphery and we look at where the somatosensory modalities originate, we find a potpourri of different types of, uh, of endpoints where the input is coming in. And we'll be talking about that soon. So here we go. Here is our friend, the uh, uh, DRG neurons. And uh, uh, basically the ones that I'm going to be talking about are the two branched uh, uh, axons, a pseudo unipolar or, uh, and what you then have is this uh, thing coming in either out at the receptor or going into the um, going into the spinal cord. Okay, so all sensory information caudal to the neck is conveyed by DRG neurons, but some of those uh, DRG neurons will enter in most of them will enter in uh, either medially if they're heavily myelinated or laterally if they're lightly or unmyelinated through the dorsal horn, but a certain number of dorsal root ganglion neurons, primarily C-type fibers, will also enter the spinal cord via the ventral horn. So it becomes pretty uh, uh, co uh, complex here as we're, uh, as we're looking at this system. And, um, and basically what you uh, basically see here is uh, properties of, of uh, uh, terminals. So uh, we have two major types of terminals, one which is called encapsulated, uh, touch and mechanoreception, proprioception, et cetera. And then, um, and then the second is called the bare nerve ending for pain and temperature. And so notice right away here that the encapsulated type of terminal can do at least two different modalities and the bare nerve ending can do at least two different modalities. And the classic bare ending, one that we basically talk about is um, uh, uh, the free nerve ending. So the encapsulated mechanoreceptors, very often a large diameter, they're myelinated and they have rapid conduction. And of course, a large, large ma uh, majority of those are entering medially and right into the dorsal column. Then we have the free endings, thermal and nociceptors and other chemoreceptors. They're small diameter. They can be unmyelinated C or thinly myelinated A delta. You can see them down at the bottom, A alpha, A beta, A delta, and then C, which is unmyelinated. 
and uh, they have slower conduction. And you can see some major things that it plays a role in. So muscle control, touch vibration, position perception, then cold perception and pain, warm perception and pain. And then when you get out here, uh, you can have gut function, uh, GI transit, uh, blood pressure, sweating, et cetera. So all of those uh, types of things that we uh, basically uh, see. So uh, another question here is why do we have uh, rapid conducting information? Well, the rapid conducting information, because you have heavily myelinated fibers, is the only interchange of ions neurophysiologically are gonna happen at uh, nodes of Ron VA. And they, uh, the, uh, the node spacing and whatever plays a very major role in speeding up that activity. And of course, the other interesting thing is that if you were basically designing some sort of a nervous system, you might go, well, the most important thing is, isn't it, isn't it most important to know when we are in mortal danger of survival and whatever? And what's the best thing to signal that? Pain. So you might think in, in a way, well, that should be the most heavily myelinated to get up to the brain, yell to the brain, hey, there's pain, and boom, uh, the brain goes, emergency, emergency, get away, pull your foot away, do this, that, and the other thing. But yet, what do we find? We find that uh, it's the exact opposite, that in pain, they are mostly unmyelinated, of uh, free nerve endings, and uh, and why? Because what we then realize that we have something else that goes on here. What goes on here is that in some cases we don't need a brain to do that. That basically we have at the level of the spinal cord that already tells us roughly where the pain is coming from. That what we have is the classic thing called the reflex to basically pull it out, which is happening right at the same level of the spinal cord from the dorsal horn down to the ventral horn, and then we do uh, a, a, a removal. So uh, a lot of times when you start to think about a system, and very often when we think about systems, we usually think about vitalistic systems. And what, I, what do I mean by vitalism? That we are somehow, somehow special, and again, I'm not going into metaphysical or theological arguments here, uh, and that that uh, uh, that we are then endowed with a system like this. And if we were to go and pick a vitalistic argument, we'd basically argue a top-down system. That is, we have uh, we have a brain, we have a cortex, we have whatever, and this is the thing that is um, uh, controlling things. But if we look at actually how the system was phylogenetically organized, we see that it's bottom up. And that one of the earliest things is to do what? It is to have a reflexive act at the level of the, uh, uh, door, uh, uh, of the spinal cord or the primeval brain where this information is coming in. So now, we again uh, look at uh, the, these things. I'm not going to go into much detail here. You can read all about this, that when we're looking at these uh, A alpha, A beta, A delta, and C, those are terms that basically have to do with somatosensory information. There's correlates. There are uh, motor fibers, which is uh, in this column, a uh, muscle nerve in, in which you have uh, uh, type one, type two, type three, and type four. And uh, the way the muscle nerves and the cutaneous nerves share it is you can actually look and measure their fiber diameters and you can see a large diameter uh, 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 fiber can be up as high as 20 micra and can have a conduction velocity as high of 
120 meters per second. So again, when I gave you that classic example last uh, uh, thing about Shaquille O'Neal and his, um, his big toe, uh, the information uh, coming in, it has to travel quite a distance, but those large diameter fibers are traveling. Note that there's a 60, a 60 um, fold difference in the conduction velocity of a uh, large diameter fiber uh, be uh, an unmyelinated fiber. So you tra the information is traveling, um, uh, traveling uh, 60 times the speed, and it's not crossing the synapse until we get all, get all the way up to the medulla. Whereas the C-type fibers, what are they doing? They're entering in through the dorsal horn, they're entering in through the ventral horn, and then they synapse, and then they take a much more circuitous route of crossing the anterior, the axon, the second order axons are crossing the anterior white commissure and going into the lateral spinal thalamic tract. And then we'll see what the hell happens to that. So, and the reason why is because what are you doing? You're increasing signal strength. How are you increasing signal strength? Well, if you have your largest axons, they have the lowest resistance simply because of the myelinization. Okay, and then progressively smaller diameter axons going to uh, going to um, uh, uh, un um, uh, 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 going to uh, unmyelinated fibers. Uh, they're going to have a great a greater amount of leakiness and things like that. So that C type fiber, if you basically look at that, it probably has the worst kind of pain. The uh, so-called first pain, burning pain, versus the second type of pain, which is uh, described, you know, whatever, which is throbbing pain and things like that. And what do we basically know about burning pain? What we basically have in burning pain versus throbbing pain is we really have the ability of, of honing in exactly where that pain is happening. Okay, so if you put your foot in a campfire, you know you put your foot in a campfire versus if you have a throbbing pain because you have some uh, lower intestinal gurgling going on, you're not exactly sure where the thing is. And then, of course, we then go back to something we looked at at the beginning of the last class where we uh, basically looked at dermatomes. So again, what you can basically see here is uh, here are the various types of responses that you get from uh, 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 various types of uh, various types of myelinated and unmyelinated fibers. And then you look way out here, you see the C-type fiber is a much smaller type of uh, potential that basically. Uh, uh, goes on. But again, uh, in order to cover this entire course, they basically are moving on. So again, we basically talked about the encapsulated uh, uh, non-neural and uh, the bare nerve endings. So now we can basically go and say, well, if there was a labeled line, and there was a, um, a, a, a specific distinct type of receptor, especially like a hair cell for audition or an odor cell for olfaction or a particular taste uh, cell uh, on the papillae of the tongue that picks out the very specific thing about sour. Look at what, look at what happens here. What we basically have here is a, a world of different types of receptors, both for touch and for proprioception. So we have the Merkel disc, the Meissner's corpuscle, the Piscinian corpuscle, 
the Ruffini ending, the field receptor, then we have a hair receptor, which is basically on a, gla uh, on, uh, a non glabrous skin. Gla uh, glabrous skin, of course, is hairless. And then C mechanoreceptors. And then when we look at proprioception, we have a muscle spindle primary, a muscle spindle secondary, a Golgi tendon organ, a joint capsule mechanicos receptor, and then stretch sensitive free nerve endings, which are different from the free nerve endings that are C mechanoreceptors. I am not going to go through each one of these things. Hopefully, anybody who does a good course in perception these days would do this. And of course, in a neurophysiology course, one might then consider all of the transduction uh, effects that are going on. So what is that word that I just brought up? Transduction. What transduction is, is taking uh, a sensory, uh, taking stimuli and changing their very nature. So if you look at a Merkel disc, a Merkel disc is basically sensitive to pressure. So that pressure goes on the arm, pressure goes on the hand, on the finger, on the fingertip. And, um, and the, uh, this then gets translated into um, into pressure within the disc, the disc is physically moving, and then the disc will start to produce either a high threshold um, a single signal, or it may produce rated signals if in the possibility that it's wide dynamic range. And in this, what you're then able to do is if you think about it, and think about it, the two different ways that you're doing, with pressure, pressure is usually defined as the outside stimulus, as being the as being the um, generator. So that all of a sudden something is now leaning on you and pressuring you and pressuring you until you you you, you respond, and that's passive because it's happening to you. A Merkel disc actually can do active because you can deal with texture. And what do you mean by texture? Yes, the pressure could have different textures to it, like you can be, be pressured by something that has different gradations of sandpaper or something. But in texture, very often, it is us doing, we're doing some active thing and we are palpating uh, a, a surface in order to identify what it is, where it is, and whatever. It's always like the famous story of uh, the different blind men touching uh, different parts of the elephant. And now, moving from Merkel disc to Meissner's corpuscle, we look at a Meissner's corpuscle, and now we're dealing with movement. And then we have the Piscinian corpuscle, which is dealing with vibration. Vibration and movement are two dimensions of the same thing, because there is some type of uh, 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 on the uh, uh, two dimensions of the same thing. If the movement is something that is passive, and the vibration is something that's passive. On the other hand, you can have active movement, and the Meissner corpuscle will pick up that. The difference between a um, a Meissner's corpuscle and a Piscinian corpuscle is exactly where they're located. You will find Meissner's corpuscles in much higher concentrations out on the external dermal surface, whereas a Piscinian corpuscle, you're basically going to find in an epidermal or a subdermal area, uh, and you start to get the vibration. And the same thing with a Ruffini ending. A Ruffini ending and um, a field receptor is very much where you're dealing with skin stretch, but you're not dealing with it on the uh, outer surface, but you're dealing with it a, a, a series of, uh, 
of, of uh, layers down. Then when we look at proprioception, we're basically looking at all of the different things that happen with a, um, with a, uh, um, uh, a muscle. So uh, here I go into something I love to watch, but I was never any good at. So when I grew up on the streets of New York City and there would be a stickball game in which the two best players would throw a, uh, a cutoff broomstick in the air and then catch it and the guys would go like this and whoever got the top and the guy would kick it. And if, uh, if, uh, if he didn't kick it, the guy holding the stick got to pick choice uh, first. So he'd be the LeBron James character and pick this person and pick that person. And of course you'd pick out a team and it'd be like seven kids on either side. I was invariably the next to last, the last person to get picked. All right, but I still like baseball and stuff like that. And uh, I, I always think of baseball when you're thinking about uh, proprioceptive effects. And you basically go and you watch a baseball game and you watch a pitcher and how that pitcher, A, holds the ball and then throws it and then does things. So the classic thing of what is called a changeup, where a person throws a ball and they're throwing it at uh, 99 miles an hour. And so we basically going, oh, is he really, uh, when they throw, uh, uh, is really exerting himself. And you can see the muscle spindle primary is basically looking at the muscle length and stretch as to where the muscle is in space. And then the second, uh, the second thing is looking at muscle stretch, how far you go out and whatever. So we are throwing that. Now, the point is, if I'm standing there as a batter, and I'm watching this guy who can throw a 99 mile an hour fastball. Uh, I'm going to be trying to time my bat as the ball is leaving the hand to basically figure out where the ball's going to end up and where, where I should swing it. Because if I take just a tiny little bit about the time, the ball's by me and I miss. Now, what happens if I know that pitcher? not only can throw a 99 mile an hour fastball, they can throw an 81 mile an hour changeup. Okay, so all of a sudden now the speed is coming in at a difference of 18 miles an hour and I'm expecting a fastball, so I swing way ahead, at, uh, ahead of the changeup. Now, if all of a sudden this picture uh, shows some difference in uh, their muscles, in terms of the length, where it's released, how it's released, and whatever, as a good batter, I can pick that up. And after a couple of times I'm up, I can figure out that as the guy is about to deliver, oh, this is going to be a change up. I'll hold back a little bit and then whack it out of the park. But why? Who are the great, uh, great pitches? So somebody like Max Scherzer of the Washington Nationals or uh, Garrett Cole of the Yankees both throw 99, 100 miles an hour fastball. They also throw 78 mile an hour changeups and they throw them into exactly the same place. But if you basically look at the way their arm is going and how they extend, the two things are, are uh, uh, virtually identical. So uh, uh, Max Scherzer and Jared Cole have incredible proprioceptive abilities. So how did they make a difference in terms of uh, whether the ball's going to come in at 99 or 82? It's a very subtle change in the grip uh, and uh, positioning of the ball in their hands as they release it. And that's what basically does that. So you can see all, you have a, a, a whole host of different types of label lines that are bringing in touch information and proprioceptive information. So, um, and then you can basically look at this. I am 
just not going to be covering that. And here we can basically look at the um, uh, the uh, uh, various things that we basically talked about. So here is uh, non-glabrous a hairy skin. Here's glabrous skin. Now uh, notice out here uh, superficially uh, uh, with uh, some of these things, we really don't have um, that, uh, 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 that many receptors. But what we start to do is we can see when we go a little bit deeper, we have Merkel's discs right here. We have Meissner's corpuscles right here. We then have in deep, deeper skin, the Pacinian corpuscles, which is playing a role with the, um, uh, uh, with vibration. And then we have the Ruffini nerve endings. And you can see the Ruffini nerve endings are tied very much into non-glabrous Sahari skin. But the most important thing is with glabrous skin, and of course we don't have, we, we, we don't have hairs growing out of our fingertips because that's the place where we have the highest degree of tactile acuity in the fingers, the palm, the sole of foot, the lips, etc. These have very, very high um, uh, acuity versus uh, other parts of the skin. So here is the Merkel cell. Uh, basically, you can see that it's sitting just under those ridges. They're slow adapting. They will continue to respond with continued uh, pressure. They have high spatial tactile acuity and they are innervated by type one fibers. So the type one fibers are heavily myelinated. So what is gonna happen to the 99% of all Merkel cells when they get activated they are gonna go enter into the spinal cord at whatever level they're in, either uh, the lumbar or the, uh, the, uh, the cervical levels, and they're gonna be shooting up right through the dorsal columns, right up to the caudal medulla. Okay. And here you can basically uh, uh, see this uh, with the, uh, with the thing. So before we were looking at pressure, here we're looking at texture. So uh, where you're touching something and you're figuring out, you're figuring out what is uh, there. So in this kind of experiment, you have these dots. So are you able to palpate where the dot is and what the positions of the dots are? And you can basically see that there is a, a spatial event and you're responding this, and you have some sort of neural representation, a so-called transduction between what the surface that you're palpating and the interior type of somatosensory signal. Then we have our friend, the Meissner's corpuscle, which is now interested in movement, stroking. So movement is an active thing. Stroke is what? Stroke is um, your palp, you're doing something active versus flutter, where flutter is something on the surface, all of a sudden, let's say a hummingbird came very close to you and was moving and you would feel, feel the air and the changes. And again, you have all of these characteristics. And whereas the Merkel cell was slow adapting, the uh, the Meissner's corpuscle is rapid adapting because you're responding to mo motion. And the point is, it's not that it's saying, I want to keep monitoring that I'm keeping movement. Movement is what? Movement is something where you started with nothing and now you moved. It's an on off. That's the point at which the Meissner's corpuscle is going to respond. And then when you stop moving, that'll be a thing and that'll be an off, okay? So that's why uh, uh, you're picking up things there. And we basically can see many of the perceptual things about movement, stroke, and flutter 
is very much explained in these deeper types of, um, of somatosensory cells that are found uh, in the subdermal area. Then what we have is the Pacinian corpuscle. And now, whereas with uh, a mycinous corpuscle where there's movement, and the movement might be highly, um, uh, 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 highly uh, specific and, and whatever, so you know that you move one little thing, not the whole hand or not uh, things like that, the Pacinian corpuscle, again, is a passive system. It is picking up rapid changes in pressure. And again, you're moving from what? No response to steady uh, pressure. And what you have is it's rapidly adapting. You all of a sudden recognize that there is a change, a vibration type of thing. And it's found uh, uh, much deeper in the skin and glabrous, um, glabrous, both glabrous and hairy in the intestines, in whatever. So what do you end up doing? Uh, you know, uh, um, when I'm up here, I usually watch uh, MSNBC, and then you go to wonderful things like the commercials. And always the commercials on MSNBC are, um, are directed towards people like me old thoughts that may have some kind of pre-existing pre type of condition. And one of the conditions that you basically can have is, I don't have it, thank God, is irritable bowel syndrome. You know, you see the person, I'm going to go and do this. Oh, I can't do it because I have to go to the bathroom and I have to stay here. So the intestines, you know, all of a sudden you get the uh, these uh, interoceptive stimuli that basically feel a, a, a vibration, a change in peristaltic things, because all of a sudden the food is moving much quicker through the GI tract, and you might go and have to visit the bathroom pretty quickly. Uh, so uh, you can see that not only for vibration uh, out in the periphery, but you can uh, start to detect um, interoceptive stimuli as well. Then the Ruffini. Uh, receptors have to do with stretch. So all of a sudden, you're now starting to stretch your skin and uh, it links subcutaneous tissue to folds in the skin, like at the joints of wrists and fingers, in the palm, fingernails, uh, and whatever. And you're, uh, you're now, again, doing something active. You're palpating. So whereas, um, uh, on the other hand, you were uh, 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 looking at the Merkel disk and you were basically trying to figure out um, uh, 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 what the surface is. In a Ruffini uh, thing, you are now grasping a shape and you're basically stretching to see whether you can hang on to it in some way, shape, or form. So it's a different type of signal and, and that's what the Ruffini receptor is going to basically go and do. Then we have uh, cutaneous. Uh, so again, we look at these uh, things and we see that uh, the uh, Merkel disc and the Ruffini end, uh, uh, ending are usually slow, whereas the Meissner's corpuscle and the Pacinian corpuscle are fast. Uh, and uh, so slow adapting versus fast adapting. The slow adapting is telling you whether things continue to occur and you're monitoring that either in terms of grasp or in terms of palpating. Whereas the Meissner's corpuscle with fast adapting is telling you did I start a movement, did I change the rate of the movement, did I, uh, 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 you know, and whatever. Okay. So, so again, uh, when we look way at the beginning, a dermatome, uh, we looked at uh, things and we saw that there are many more dermatomes out here on the fingertips, than the hands, than the arms, less in the shoulders, and then very little, especially around the back. 
So what we now look at is a receptive field. And of course, the classic thing that we can go and look at here is something called two-point discrimination. So we take something that a psychophysicist, a somatosensory psychophysicist by the name of Von Frey, F-R-E-Y, studied. And uh, he, he, he basically took and created a whole bunch of stimuli that had different types of tensile strength. That is, they were very brittle or very soft. And then they had various degrees of thicknesses. So now what you basically do is apply the so-called Von Frey hairs onto uh, the skin surface and you ask, uh, do you feel that? So what has been happening to me for the last 10 years is uh, I've been going to uh, a doctor simply because I was diagnosed a type two diabetic. And one of the things that I do every three months whenever I go to the doctor is he tells me to take off my shoes and my socks, look some other way, and then basically takes the, his equivalent of a Von Fry hair and starts touching me all around, um, uh, uh, all around my foot. And whether or not I feel something, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. And of course, what he's looking for is the possibility of neuropathy. That is that slowly but surely in a diabetic, what can happen is that the nerves start to die, they start to fail. And of course, uh, uh, another point of that is you're then not aware uh, uh, interoceptive stimuli about the nature of your foot and what can happen to people. They basically start to develop gangrene and things like that, and they start losing toes, and then they may lose a foot, and they may lose a leg uh, because of this peripheral neuropathy that's caused, uh, that is a, a cause of diabetes. But um, when I'm basically thinking about um, uh, uh, von Frey hair, and we're thinking about this, uh, that's uh, the diabetic neuropathy is a gross kind of thing of basically saying is a stimulus there or not. But what becomes a finer thing and basically demonstrates the whole thing of a dermatome is taking uh, 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 these von Frey hairs where a person can be aware quite often that they are being touched uh, by the von Frey hair. So you want a 99% um, uh, touch rate, but you're now asked the question. What you're asked is not what you touched, but how many things touched you? That was it one von Frey hair or two von Frey hairs? And of course, if you basically go onto your uh, fingertips and you have two von Frey hairs touching, you will invariably report to, you know, not, uh, not visualizing it. However, what now, uh, what may, uh, what uh, uh, starts to happen is you systematically vary where those two von Frey hairs are getting closer and closer and closer. And eventually what happens is on your, uh, on your fingertip, you may all of a sudden, even though you were touched with two Von Frey hairs that were in very, very, very close um, proximity to one another, you picked it up as one. So basically what is happening, you are now within the receptive field of that sensory neuron that is picking up that small pressure. Now, you look at the receptive fields of your of your uh, fingertips, and then you look at the receptive fields of your back, and what basically uh, happens, the amount of uh, 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 the area of a receptive field on the small of your back is far, far, far larger than, of course, what you have on your fingertips, which is why if you're going to go and you're going to palpate a surface, you don't go walk over, uh, pull down your pants, 
stick your butt up against the thing to figure out what it is. Use your fingertips simply because you're getting you're getting far more somatic sensory information uh, that way. Okay, so. And here we can see this. And one of the things you can see right here is again, look at this, look at this uh, difference. And remember what a Merkel cell does, what a Meissner's corpuscle does, what a Piscinian uh, corpuscle does, and what a Ruffini end organ does. The Ruffini end organ is dealing with stretch. There's not too many, there aren't many Ruffini end organs on. Uh, 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 on a, a fingertip. So, you, uh, but what do you see with a Meissner's corpuscle where you're uh, uh, all of a sudden uh, 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 measuring things here? You're incredibly sensitive, and there's far more of these Meissner's corpuscles found in that, uh, in, in that area versus the Merkel cell versus the Piscinian corpuscle, and certainly versus the Ruffini end organ. And there's your two-point threshold. And here, uh, so you have two-point thresholds here. And then here, you can have uh, grading. So you're basically feeling uh, the grate and uh, testing like different levels of like sandpaper and whatever in terms of figuring out things. And of course, here is a wonderful dermatomal arrangement. And basically what you see here is where is the uh, two point threshold. Notice that for the back and the calf and the, sh and the shoulder and the upper arm, what you have is there's quite a distance uh, before all of a sudden you start reporting that there was one stimulus instead of two. And then you basically look here and you see the cheek, the nose, the upper lip, and then look at all of your fingers and your thumb and you're doing what? You're doing an incredible amount. Uh, there is where you're getting the uh, highest degree of, of, uh, of palpation and understanding and differentiating. Because once you're able to say there's two, when there are two, boom, you have a much, uh, 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 you have a much more refined thing of, of, of touch. Okay. And here we go, basically said that. And here is the preferred temporal uh, it's frequencies of these. So you can see a Merkel cell is, um, has a uh, relatively slow frequency range, whereas a Piccinian corpuscle, which is measuring vibration, has a very high uh, frequency range. But uh, the temporal frequencies are much more important for vibration and stretching than they are for pressure. Uh, flutter is something in between. And again, uh, uh, looking at these uh, uh, receptive fields of the Meissner corpuscle, Merkel cell, Vicinian corpuscle, and Ruffini end organ. Okay, and then uh, there's a summary of that. And again, we've talked about the dorsal column and spinal thalamic tracts. I'll be now talking about how you get there. And then the dorsal lateral tract that we want to uh, basically cover. So now we go to the dorsal column system. So uh, I think uh, this is a classic slide from the neuroanatomist uh, Malcolm Carpenter, who spent a career at the uniform health services organization. I think it basically gives us a wonderful kind of explanation. So the dorsal column system, remember, are going to be primarily A alpha and A beta fibers that are uh, that enter 
immediately through the dorsal root ganglion into the spinal cord and then immediately ascend um, through the dorsal columns in a somatotopic fashion so that the more medial the fiber as you're looking, uh, as you're going ascending through the dorsal column, the more caudal in the body you are. So the sacral fibers are going to be most medial, then lumbar fibers, then lower thoracic fibers, then upper thoracic fibers, and then cervical fibers being most lateral. And they maintain that uh, trajectory as they go through all of the different levels of the spinal cord, come up into C1, and then come into the caudal medulla, and where they are going to synapse now in the nucleus gracilis or nucleus, uh, nucleus gracilis or nucleus cuneatus. And obviously, fibers within the fasciculus gracilis synapse on the nucleus gracilis, Fibers that synapse on the nucleus cuneatus are in the fasciculus cuneatus. Nothing crosses. The other important thing is that this dorsal column system is at this point ipsilateral. So when we compare it with its two counterparts, the lateral th spinothalamic tract and the anterior spinothalamic tract, here is a major difference because the anterior and lateral spinothalamic tracts have already 100% decussated across the anterior white commissure at the level of the spinal cord at which it entered or a couple of levels up from there. So this is now ipsilateral and it's very fast A alpha, A beta fibers. So now, we have gone from all the way down in the sacral cord up through the cervical cord, now into this caudal medulla, and we get synapse number one. Here is synapse number one, right here. But now, one of the things we learned about with the somatosensory system is that the somatosensory system is represented in the brain contralateral to the side of the area of stimulation. So the right side of the body is represented in the left side of the brain. The left side of the body is represented in the right side of the brain. So how does it get there? Well, the nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus give rise again to heavily myelinated fibers. And what they do they are still part in the very caudal medulla. Now, again, I apologize because sometimes I bas uh, basically we say something is located somewhere. And what did I basically say when I said the ventricular system? The ventricular system, the fourth ventricle is found in the pons and medulla. And then what I said was, the central canal is found in the spinal cord. Yet in the far caudal medulla, we still have a central canal. And we're going to see that next week when we get into the medulla. So the axons from the right side of uh, the second order neurons of nu uh, nucleus gracilis, nucleus cuneatus, and from the left side, what they do is they move inferiorly and they straddle, they basically turn around the um, central canal, okay? And you basically see, you remember when we looked at the, um, when we looked at the corticospinal tract and we saw the 95% of the fibers that decussay, we saw, it sounds like it just happens instantaneously. But what you saw was that this took a bit of time to do that. And the same thing goes on for the fibers of the, uh, the second order fibers of the nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus. Those fibers at that point, as they're turning around the central canal, 
are given the term internal arcuate fibers. So right here, these are called internal arcuate fibers, okay? And what they do is they come inferiorly and laterally to the central canal, and then they come under the central canal and they cross. Now, internal arcuate gives you a signal because what arcuate basically means is bow-like. And that's basically what you're basically seeing. You're seeing a sort of bow-like shape. And they literally decussate. Once they decussate, we now change the goddamn name of the fibers. We now call them the medial lemniscus, L-E-M-N-I-S-C-U-S. And the medial lemniscus is the, uh, 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 are the axons of the nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus that travel up to the ventro posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus, right up to there. So notice what they're doing. They're ascending through the medulla, all the way through the medulla, all the way through the pons, all the way through the midbrain. And then they finally synapse in the BPL nucleus of thalamus. So whereas of this dorsal column system, whereas the nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus are synapse number one in the system, the BPL nucleus of thalamus is synapse number two. So now the axons of the VPL thalamus maintain that somatotopic organization that we saw with the fasciculus gracilis and fasciculus cuneatus, that we saw with the nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus, that we saw with the medial lemniscus, the axons of the VPL thalamus somatotopically go to the post-central gyrus of the cerebral cortex. And how do they go? They go through it through the posterior limb of the internal capsule. So the posterior limb of the internal capsule contains the axons, the somatotopic axons of the post-central gyrus. So now when we look at the post-central gyrus, where, they, where we get finally to synapse number three, it is organized such that the most superior and medial is going to be the most posterior part of the body, whereas the, uh, out on the lateral surface, we're going to have the most rostral part of the body. And what we're going to be basically seeing pretty quickly is that this dorsal column system this medial lemniscus system and everything is going to be joined by another system called the trigeminothalamic system, which is what's going to innovate a lot, a large amount of our face. So we're going to have all of that information eventually up here in the postcentral gyrus. So let's start to uh, again look at this step by step. The fasciculus gracilis has the sacral fibers, most medial, lumbar fibers, and then lateral to sacral. The lower thoracic fibers are lateral to lumbar. Then we have the dorsolateral septum, and we now have the fasciculus cuneatus, and we have upper thoracic fibers that are most medial in the cuneate fasciculus, and cervical fibers that are lateral to the upper thoracic. So we maintain this somatotopic organization. And then what they basically do is there is a synapse of either a fasciculus uh, gracilis or a fasciculus cuneatus neuron. So right here is a, uh, a, a, a gracile or cuneate nucleus. And what they're basically going to eventually do is they're eventually gonna go up to BPL thalamus 
and then they're basically going to go up to uh, the post-central gyrus of somatosensory cortex. Now, there's a very interesting thing that's going on here because remember the type of fibers that we're dealing with. We're dealing with fibers that are coming from Merkel cells. So they can start telling us about pressure, either active pressure or passive pressure. The, uh, we're gonna have information about mycinous corpuscles. We're gonna have information about piscinian corpuscles. And we have some information about Ruffini stretch organs. And of course, all of these things are right next to each other. And sometimes we will have very punctate stimuli. So we have a very high probability of knowing exactly A, what the nature of the stimulus is. Is it movement? Is it pressure? Is it um, uh, vibration, et cetera, et cetera. And then in adjacent areas, you may have very little, so it's very punctate. So if we basically look out on the skin here and we have something that's punctate, you have a strong input. And then on either side, medial or lateral or superior and inferior, you have a weaker input. Now they go to different cells uh, 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 they're carried by different fibers going into different cells of the gracile acuneate nucleus. The one with the strongest input gets here. But now in the somatosensory system, just like we have in the visual system, to really increase acuity, is we have uh, uh, two different things, two processes happen. One is that the stimulated uh, uh, cell uh, or axon sends that maximal amount of stimulation to the appropriate uh, guy in its chain. But in addition, it sends out collaterals to immediately neighboring gracile acuneate nuclei cells. And what they do here is they provide neighboring inhibition. It's called collateral inhibition. And of course, who was the guy who basically discovered collateral inhibition in the, in the, um, uh, 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 in the uh, uh, eye was a guy by the name of Stephen Kupfler. And Stephen Kupfler's, one of Stephen Kupfler's students was David Ubel, and then he paired up with Torsten Wiesel. So you saw, for those of you who saw Josh Brumberg's talk yesterday, when he was a young little baby at the Bronx High School of Science, all four summers, he had the ability to work with the then Nobel Prize winner, uh, 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 Torsten Wiesel. And of course, what they did was basically, well, talk about the thing of figuring out uh, how the visual system works. The person working here was Vernon Mountcastle. And when Stephen Kuffler uh, 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 graduated David Ubel, he sent him down to Vernon Mountcastle's lab. And then, Ber and, but because Ubel was more interested in vision, he talked to Mountcastle and then uh, worked with, um, uh, uh, and Mountcastle figured out this collateral inhibition for the somatosensory system, just like Kuffler figured out the collateral inhibition model for the um, visual system. So uh, Ubel benefited from both of those things. So the point is, three people, a maximum of three people can only get a Nobel Prize in one of the area, uh, in uh, one of the, uh, uh, in a given area. So in 77 or 78, I'm having a senior moment here, uh, Jubel and Weasel won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine. They shared it with a guy named Roger Sperry. And I'm not gonna go into, I'll talk about Roger Sperry later, but they will like apples and oranges. They put these, uh, these Nobel Prize winners together. Why didn't 
Stephen Cutler get a Nobel Prize? And why didn't Vernon Mountcastle get a, a Nobel Prize? Because in some way, shape or form, their work in a lot of ways explained and predated and with the shoulders upon which you could stand on uh, for Jubel and Weasel's findings. Well, in the case of Stephen Cutler, he died. And they don't, the only way they now give, and it happened last year or the year before, where a person um, was given the Nobel Prize, but then they, were, they didn't get the award until five months later, they died in the interim. And they still gave that award out because it was, it was awarded uh, uh, when they, with the announcement. But Kuffler died before Jubel and Weasel were named to the Nobel Prize. My guess is there would have been a 98% probability that they would have given the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine to Jubel, Weasel, and Kuffler if he lived. Mountcastle, so why, if Kuffler died, why not give it to Mountcastle? Because uh, a lot of the mechanisms that Jubel and Weasel worked with in the visual system were explained by Mountcastle's work in the uh, somatosensory system. Well, rumor has it, never met the man, but he supposedly was one of the biggest bastards in the history of neuroscience. So nobody liked him. Okay, so it sounds like that's why he didn't get it. And they twisted themselves into a uh, pretzel. They said Sperry deserved it for a whole bunch of other things. So they put the three of them together. But in any case, you have this collateral inhibition. So what does that basically do is the very nature of the system, the anatomical system with these collaterals that come up and activating into neurons produce what is called feed forward inhibition. And so if, if there was 10 units of stimulation here and eight units of stimulation here and eight units of stimulation here, the 10 units uh, are pretty much, so let's say maybe nine units are here because there's feed forward inhibition from those neighboring things. But down here, because it is a, a neighboring inhibition, or collateral inhibition, what basically happens, uh, 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 this becomes sharpened and the number of excitatory units go down because of this inhibition. And this inhibition not only happens with the incoming uh, axon, but it also happens with the second order axons that come out and produce feedback inhibition there. So it's a very, very powerful and refined system where we basically see uh, some of these um, uh, powerful effects of amplifying the somatosensory signals. So again, uh, when we look at the um, when we look at the medulla, and we look at uh, the relay stations of the uh, uh, here we are with the nucleus gracilis and the nucleus uh, cuneatus. Uh, you're basically seeing um, these things uh, coming up. And very interesting here, you can literally go through uh, either a, a, a fasciculus gracilis or a fasciculus cuneatus, and you can basically see the hands and the feet are uh, uh, out here, and the sacrum is right along the midline. And the rostral one-third seems very much playing a role in proprioception. The middle third uh, is this exteroception. And the caudal third is both exteroproception and proprioception. Okay. So now we basically move um, uh, through the um, uh, uh, through the medial lemniscus, this first axon system. So what we can see here is the nucleus gracilis and the nucleus cuneatus. They give rise to these internal arcuate fibers, 
going around the central canal here, and then uh, uh, crossing the midline and becoming part of the ascending medial lemniscus. And the medial lemniscus, oh, come on, give me my thing here, uh, ascends through the medulla and ascends through the pons. Now, something very interesting happens. And this is the medial lemniscus is not only uh, incredibly important um, uh, functionally, but it is also a magnificent marker of where you are in the brain very quickly, because you can very often see the medial lemniscus because of its obvious size, where it is. So when you have those internal arcuate fibers crossing here, you have the medial lemniscus vertically aligned, and it keeps that vertical alignment through the medulla, and then all of a sudden, it changes its alignment as you get up into the ponds, where now it becomes uh, um, uh, uh, horizontally aligned. And then as we ascend into the midbrain, what we basically now start to see is the horizontally aligned vertical uh, 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 medial lemniscus move more laterally, and then it uh, uh, assumes like a boomerang shape. And why? Because it's about to enter into the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus. So we can see the trajectory of the medial lemniscus as it uh, goes. Now, look at the word medial lemniscus. So it's not called the lemniscus. If, it, if there's a medial lemniscus, what can you possibly uh, infer? What you can possibly infer is that there is a lateral lemniscus. And indeed, there is a lateral lemniscus. And where will we find the lateral lemniscus? Lateral to the medial lemniscus. What is the functional significance of the lateral lemniscus? It is also a sensory relay pathway, but it's uh, the sensory uh, condition is audition. So the medial lemniscus is involved in somatosensory input. The lateral lemniscus is involved in auditory input. Let me just... Here a second. Can you repeat that again? I'm sorry. You said lateral is auditory and medial is what? Medial is somat somatosensory. Uh, I'm Thank just trying, I'm looking here for a second. Give me a moment. Okay, it's 1108. What I'm going to basically do right now is uh, let's take about a two minute break, stand up, run around. And like I'm doing, I'm going to uh, warm up my coffee, okay? Okay. So there we are with the medial lemniscus. And now, so now let's look at synapse number two the VPL nucleus of the thalamus, and it's gonna project up to something called S1, which is primary, 
a somatosensory cortex, and then S2, which is called secondary um, uh, somatosensory cortex. S1 is uh, obviously the postcentral gyrus. S2 you can find in the superior and inferior parietal lobules, um, uh, uh, mostly on a superior surface. So, how does uh, how does uh, this information go? Well, if we look at number five here, we can see gray matter, and within this gray matter, and this cross section was my pointer, is the VPL nucleus of thalamus. So the axons, the axons of uh, the VPL thalamus enter into the posterior limb of the internal capsule and then travel up to the postcentral gyrus. So uh, number, I'm sorry, right here, number four is the um, posterior limb of the internal capsule and you're going up to the um, postcentral gyrus. Okay. So now, when we look at the postcentral gyrus, we see S1, S2, uh, and, and S2, and you can basically see that um, the uh, the central sulcus, the postcentral gyrus, and then you see the posterior posterior parietal areas, and you basically have the afferent flow of uh, information. So um, all of this information of VPL and VPM are basically coming into this primary um, uh, uh, somatosensory information. And this type of information, a lot of it, will then get combined up and go into what is called the ventral st stream. And a ventral stream uh, information goes into medial temporal areas. So a lot of the somatosensory information that's coming in is going into medial temporal areas and of course will then influence um, the hippocampus which has to do with short-term memory and then it also goes into things like the um, amygdala where there may be emotional uh, information coming in. On the other hand, uh, uh, other parts of the VPL will actually enter into the dorsal stream, which goes to frontal motor areas. And what you basically have here is this somatosensory input is now reinforcing or working with what we call procedural memory. That is uh, memory that has to do with priming, memory that has to do with motor memory, like riding a bike, uh, you know, uh, using an implement, things like that. Okay. And the dorsal column synapse, as I pointed out, basically uh, shows that here we're on here is the superior surface of the brain. Here's the lateral surface of the brain. And here is the uh, uh, a medial surface as we move in. And what you basically notice here is that we have uh, 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 genitalia, and then the toes, the foot, the hip, going all the way out and around and whatever. And of course, represented here is this classic idea of a homunculus so that a homunculus is not a equally distributed creature. Basically, this homunculus is a sort of representation of that dermatomal map. So that basically what you're seeing is very large fingertips. You see a smaller arm. You see a very small torso. Then you see a very large head with enormous lips and, of course, very large genitalia. 
because in all of these things, this sort of represents in a lot of ways all of those somatosensory representations that we talked about previously. Okay, so now um, uh, the point of the matter is, is in the thalamus, this homunculus becomes inverted. And this is where you start to see all of these, uh, all of these uh, 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 changes in terms of the representation. Okay, and again, what you basically have is this interesting aspect of the receptive fields of cortical neurons. So what we saw in the nucleus gracilis and the nucleus cuneatus, again, uh, gets exacerbated even further and refined and whatever in the cortical neurons because what you have is uh, what you call center surround inhibition. So that there's an inhibitory surround and a, uh, a, a center. So here all of a sudden there's a pin or a von Frey hair. And that basically what has happened when you get up into, uh, you see that there's far more release on the neurons that are in the center, less release here. And then by the time you get up into the cortex, this uh, uh, thing of feed forward inhibition uh, sort of maintains the amount of excitation that you're basically seeing here, uh, uh, here and here, but look at the amount of surrounding uh, excitation. It gets reduced because of the feed forward inhibition. And the other point is, and uh, here again, here is where Jubel and Weasel got very, very much affected by Mount Castle's work. Those of you who saw Josh Brumberg's talk yesterday saw about the whole idea of columnar organization. And then and Jubel and Weasel then went and blocked one eye uh, during development and basically saw that you can have a critical period for the widening of these uh, so-called columns. And uh, so basically in a somatosensory uh, field, what again you have is these columns. They're about 300 to 600 micro wide, and they span all six layers of the cortex. Okay. Now remember, what do you base uh, one thing you should probably know right now is that layers um, uh, three and five are, 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 get it, are, are uh, outputs, whereas layers one and two and uh, four and six are uh, lots and lots of inputs. So now what I'd like to turn to is um, turn to the spinothalamic pathways for pain and temperature and gross touch. So one of the points that I basically uh, have indicated is that a major difference between the dorsal column system and the lateral and anterior spinothalamic systems is that the dorsal column system maintains an ipsilateral uh, axonal projection all the way up to the caudal medulla, whereas the lateral and anterior spinothalamic tracts, after they synapse in lamina two through five of the dorsal horn, those second order neurons are gonna cross the uh, anterior white commissure at or near where they entered. So an important thing happens here. So now let's imagine that we have damage really on one side of the spinal cord. What it basically, and let's say it's very, very extensive damage that sort of happens all the way around here, okay? all the way around the spinal cord. 
but only on one side. You will have tactile deficits on the ipsilateral side. Why? Because you damaged that dorsal column. But you will have pain and temperature deficits on the contralateral side because what did you damage? The anterior and lateral spinothalamic tracts. So all of a sudden, where you are and where the trajectory of your pathway is going is going to have very powerful functional significance. So now, here is the anterior spinothalamic tract. So what we're basically talking about is we have uh, with the anterior spinothalamic tract, we're going to be dealing with gross pressure, gross touch, and temperature sensation. And where are, uh, uh, so an example here, look at what they show you, is a tactile receptor like a mycinus corpuscle, which is going to be picking up uh, things here of uh, having to, uh, or a free nerve ending that's temperature sensitive. So uh, these things come in, there's the dorsal root ganglion. They come, they're either A delta or C, and they synapse primarily in lamina three and lamina four of the, uh, of the uh, dorsal horn. Then the second order neurons of this anterior spinothalamic tract will literally at the, either at the level or a couple of levels uh, rostral, will cross the anterior white commissure and enter the anterior spinothalamic tract. It ascends through the lumbar cord, it ascends through the cervical cord, and it ascends into the medulla. At the medulla, usually around the middle of the medulla, the rostral medulla, the anterior spinothalamic tract joins with, in somatotopic fashion, with the medial lemniscus. So now, at the level of the pons, at the level of the midbrain, the medial lemniscus is both dorsal column fibers and anterior spinothalamic fibers. At the level of the caudal medulla, the medial lemniscus is really just dorsal column fibers because that anterior spinothalamic tract does not join. So now look at that word, spinothalamic. Originates in the spinal cord, ends up in the BPL thalamus. So what basically has happened here when the anterior spinothalamic tract joins with the medial lemniscus. We are now joining fine touch, fine pressure, gross touch, gross pressure, and temperature. And that goes up to the VPL thalamus, where it synapses a second time. It's only the second synapse, because remember the first synapse started in lamina three and four of the spinal cord. And then it joins those uh, axons, then make the posterior limb of the internal capsule, and then go up to the post central gyrus. So the anterior spinothalamic tract, eventually, as it enters into the VPL thalamus, is doing its contributions of gross touch, gross pressure, gross temperature. Uh, discrimination. So now, the lateral spinothalamic tract. Lie, lie, lie. Why? Because what did I basically tell you? That very often when you have a hyphenated name, you can imagine a hyphen between spino and thalamic. Is uh, spino is where you originated, thalamic is where you ended. 
but the lateral spinothalamic tract is a lie. Why? It's true that 100% of the fibers originated in the spinal cord, but only 5% of those fibers ever make it up to the thalamus, okay? And what is the type of information that is being carried in here? Well, you can see a heat receptor, not a therm, a, yes, a thermoreceptor, but a specific type of thermoreceptor. You're basically talking about heat, where heat is defined as what? Noxious, something you're gonna pull your hand away from, okay? It's not like a warm water bottle on a cool night where you might have a, a little bit of arthritis. And then look at this. We have a cold receptor, and a cold receptor, uh, again, is uh, uh, coming in. And this is cold where, what do you all be, have the sensation of? Is burning pain. All of a sudden you touch something like dry ice, ouch, okay? And then what you have are pain receptors, which are largely free nerve endings in the skin. And again, uh, whereas the cold and warm receptors may be more of the A-delta type, the pain receptor is very often unmyelinated. And they come in, and of course they enter the sp uh, spinal cord laterally through the dorsal root ganglion. And they now synapse in either lamina two or lamina five. With lamina two, the substantia gelatinosa being these sort of highly specific types of uh, nociceptors, something for heat, something for cold, something for pressure, something for uh, temperature, something chemo. Whereas um, some of the other fibers that come in uh, uh, come into lamina five, uh, the medial and lateral reticular nuclei are more of the wide dynamic range type. So they can have multimodal types of uh, nociceptive stimuli coming in. So you go into lamina two and lamina five. Also, what happens to a number of the lamina two and lamina five uh, axons? What they may do is never go into the lateral spinothalamic tract. Some of them may shoot right down into the ventral horn to mediate what? A nociceptive withdrawal reflex. You pull away from all of a sudden being, you know, you come in contact with a, a, a match and you pull your fingers away and you blow and everything like that and, you know, whatever. Uh, so that happens right at the spinal level. But some of them come into the lateral spinothalamic tract and what basically happens, uh, some of these, uh, uh, they go and they form the second order axons form uh, across the anterior white commissure and the, and the lateral spinothalamic tract. And they come up and they keep coming up through the spinal cord. And now they get into the medulla. And in the medulla, a whole bunch of these lateral spinothalamic neurons, uh, axons, will all of a sudden shoot off. They will not continue to the thalamus. They're gonna go to two places that I'm, and they go to a number of places, but uh, I'm gonna talk about three of them. One is they're gonna go to an area called the nucleus tractus solitarius. And the nucleus tractus solitarius has a number of functions. One of the functions it has is digestive. I'm not talking about that here. The other one they has is um, uh, res respiratory and vascular. That is the nucleus tractus solitarius that deals with res respiratory and vascular will shoot out from the nucleus tractus solitarius out into the ventral lateral medulla 
where the ventrolateral medulla can have control of heart rate. It either can speed the heart rate up, which is tachycardia, or it can slow the heart rate down, bradycardia, and it can either um, uh, uh, constrict the blood vessel, pump blood faster, or, or um, uh, uh, relax the blood vessel to pump blood slower. What it also does is control the lining around the lungs so it can change respiratory rate. And of course, when all of a sudden you come in touch with a, a nociceptive stimulus, this nociceptive stimulus doesn't have to go all the way up into the thalamus and up to the brain and then say, hey, change your heart rate, change your respiratory rate. It happens all the way down in the medulla. Remember already, some of those things went down and you might be pulling a reflex. So now you're uh, breathing a little harder. What's the second place that it goes? Second place it goes is called the ventromedial medulla. And there's a specific nucleus within the ventromedial medulla called the nucleus raphe magnus. And we'll talk about this later. But the nucleus raphe magnus sends fibers down, all the way back down into the spinal cord. And it goes specifically to the dorsal horn. And it goes very specifically to lamina two and lamina five. And what do those, uh, those uh, descending nucleus raphe magnus fibers do? They inhibit lamina two and lamina five. Basically it's saying, hey, I just got a pain message. You don't have to send me any more pain message. I got it already. It's a pain inhibitory system. Then the third type of cells are cells in the reticular formation. And they are called NRGC cells, NRGC, and they basically define, they basically tell you what they are. Nucleus, reticularis, so you're in the reticular formation, gigantocellularis, very, very large cells, NRGC, and these cells Basically, they, when they are stimulated, reach down, uh, have a bifurcating axon. Some of those fibers go all the way up into the thalamus and cortex and limbic system, and some of those fibers reach all the way down, and they go into the spinal cord. And the NRGC, as you're going to learn when we talk about the medulla, is going to be involved in an incredibly important homeostatic process. It's called consciousness. So basically, you go from sleep into slow wave sleep, into and then into waking and into alpha, then into uh, waking. Then you're basically staying there and you're building up through levels of consciousness. And of course, what happens with the nociceptive stimuli here? It's an alarm bell. It basically uh, uh, alerts the person to start to go and do something and orient, even though they may have just went and withdrew their re reflexive act. So right there in the caudal medulla, what you're basically seeing is that the is that these um, uh, 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 these spinothalamic fibers shooting off go here. Now, when we get up into the ponds, they shoot off again, and they shoot off into the uh, dorsal ponds, and they shoot off into a nucleus called the locus ceruleus, C-O-E-R-U-L-E-U-S. The locus ceruleus is the only cell group in the brain in which every cytoarchitecturally uh, defined cell of the nucleus of the locus ceruleus contains the neurotransmitter norepinephrine. Now, if you have, don't know much about norepinephrine, the one thing you know is a a a epinephrine, adrenergic, you're talking about stimulation, you're talking about sympathetic arousal. 
And the locus aurelius plays very powerful roles in arousal and attention. So now all of a sudden, you're now saying, well, where I'm going to start surveying the damage. Where the hell is the damage? Then you get up into the midbrain and those, that lateral spinothalamic tract sloughs off even more things into the colliculi and then into the periaqueductal gray. And just like the nucleus raphe magnus down here in the medulla, the uh, midbrain, the periaqueductal gray, is also powerfully involved in pain inhibition. In fact, uh, the periaqueductal gray and the uh, nucleus raphe magnus, both of them which are serotonergic cells, um, basically have on them an enormous number of opiate receptors. So when an endogenous opioid or an exogenous opiate like morphine goes in there, you will basically uh, activate those cells through this inhibition to activate this pain inhibitory system. So basically, you're, uh, you're, uh, you're activating pain inhibition, you're also at the same time activating arousal and you're activating sympathetic respiratory cardiovascular things because all of a sudden you're in pain, you may be in danger, you better get ready and boom, uh, go towards survival. So then finally, when we get up into the BPL thalamus of this lateral spinothalamic tract, what, what basically happens is we uh, only about 5% of those neurons actually get up here. But remember something, that the lateral spinothalamic tract and the anterior spinothalamic tract all come from lamina two through five. And of course the axons of lamina two through five can do one of three major things. One, they can form the anterior and lateral spinothalamic tracts. Two, they could uh, be involved in some type of reflex action at the level of the spinal cord that you're at. And three, remember that when we talked about the dorsal columns, over 60% of those dorsal column fibers are what? Those fibers that enter medially and shoot, shot, shot straight up, but about 40% of them are A delta and C fibers that come from axons of lamina two, three, four, and five, and ascending called the dorsal column postsynaptic system. So information will get having to do with gross pressure, gross touch, fine pressure, fine touch, fine temperature, gross temperature, and pain through that dorsal column and dorsal column postsynaptic system, as well as the anterior spinothalamic tract, and as well as the 5% of the lateral spinothalamic tracts that reach there. And they get then represented in the postcentral gyrus. But an awful lot of stuff has gone on. You're not waiting with a nociceptive stimulus until it gets up to the postcentral gyrus the postcentral gyrus makes some vitalistic decision. Oh my God, my toe is getting chewed off by, uh, I don't know, uh, pick something and, and, and whatever. Because uh, some of that happened all the way back when that information hit the spinal cord and you had the whole emotional aspects and, and sympathetic aspects happening along the way before you even get to the post-central uh, gyrus. So all of a sudden, you're on the move without knowing why sometimes, okay? So the whole structure of this system explains this. And here, what I have in uh, things here is a, a, a series of um, uh, a pain. We talked about nociceptors. And then what we can also talk about is, um, is uh, pathological conditions. And there is two types of pathological conditions. One 
that has to do with a painful stimulus and how we respond to it. And the second is very paradoxical. It is us responding as if it was a painful stimulus to a non-painful st st stimuli. That perception of pain in response to non-painful stimuli is called allodynia. And allodynia, one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, a good example of an allodynic uh, response is a somewhat common kind of, of uh, condition. It's called trigeminal neuralgia. So now we're talking about the face and neuralgia. We're talking about the, uh, the innovation of the face. And what can happen with uh, trigeminal neuralgia, if there is a person, a person has that, and all of a sudden they now go out into a cold environment. The temperature is getting cold and everything. And air brushes along their cheek. And it's a literal flutter response, okay? It's the cold air touching the cheek. And all of a sudden, a person with trigeminal neuralgia shows that they're uh, in excruciating pain. by, And they can literally focus it to one hair follicle sitting on the cheek that was stimulated by the flutter of the cold air and the person is responding as if they're in unbelievable pain. Now what is, now that's different from hyperalgesia. In hyperalgesia, we have a nociceptive uh, a receptor and we either have an exaggerated response of that receptor to noxious stimuli, or we have persistent pain in the absence of that stimuli, uh, simply because this free nerve ending keeps firing. Now, part of this can happen uh, in secondary uh, hyperalgesia is the un, uh, uninjured tissue surrounding a site of injury. If all of a sudden we had some injury, and now what we have is uh, in the periphery a reorganization of these uh, of, of, of uh, uh, connections and whatever. Most of that type of reorganization very often involves um, uh, uh, glutamatergic neurons. And these glutamatergic neurons may sprout and there be may, may be more of them and whatever. And we end up getting this type of uh, injury. And we see this in chronic pain in which we start to talk about things like wind up. I just don't have the time to go through this, but here are uh, these notes I think at least start to give you some further, um, further information on that. Okay, here's the, uh, and you can see some of the stuff that's happening here. You have your good old friend, Brady Kynan. Remember the Kynans, Brady Kynan, Substance B. And then a whole bunch of other kinds of substances that are produced very often because of damage and everything prostaglandins, histamine, leukotrienes, anandamide, which is very funny because then anandamide actually can act as a uh, analgesic. And if we have time, we would talk about that a little later. Anandamide, of course, is the active ingredient of THC, okay. So again, when we look at these receptor types with the bad free nerve endings, we have, um, remember their small diameter, thin unmyelinated, slower conduction. We have pain, no receptors, mechanical, thermal mechanical, thermal mechanical C5, a freezing pain, and polymodal, a slow burning pain. So you have this sort of 
very sort of, uh, and what do you know about these things? Pricking, burning, freezing, uh, uh, burning, you know, all of those. What do you have is you have, the, uh, have these things of, of fast pain. And then what do you have here? With thermal receptors, you can have uh, cooling, and then you have temperatures over uh, a hot nociceptor and a cold nociceptor at above 45 degrees centigrade or below five degrees centigrade. And of course, here you get this sort of high threshold response. Okay. Okay, and then um, I'm just not gonna go through this. So here is the first and second pain. So you basically can see uh, fast, sharp pain can happen either with uh, A, delta, and C. Uh, the, uh, uh, the intensity of the pain is much higher, but it's a much shorter duration, whereas second pain, which is dull, throbbing types of pain. I always remember uh, the commercial, I think, for Anison or something like that. They would have people being hit with a hammer, uh, people uh, getting burnt, and then people getting stabbed and go through the various types of pain there. And um, so again, you're basically looking at a probe with a uh, look at the probe with a blunt object. You get, uh, uh, you know, these pressure type responses, whereas with a pinprick, it goes up. And then with a pinch, which is uh, sharper, you have it on onset and offset. So you have all of those uh, different things that are mediated through different uh, receptors. And again, uh, we look at the high um, ordered mapping. And of course, that pain is basically, uh, that sharp pain is usually happening at places of uh, deep, uh, um, uh, of, uh, of uh, great dermatomal arrangement. Whereas when we have something like uh, lower back pain, what is always the problem of identifying exactly where the locus of the pain is simply because of the issues of dermatomal arrangement. Let me just stop this for a second. And let me go back to exiting the full screen. All right, we're at 1147. So I want to be able to spend some time here. I see chats. Let me look at those things first. Okay, oh, for me it's pain, talking about paradoxical cold that feels burning, yes. Very strange sensitivity to cold. I have trigem, I'm sorry, Sonia, you have trigeminal and that neuralgia and you can basically talk to them and tell them exactly what the horrible kinds of feelings that you have. Okay, I don't know why, Bronx science, okay. I do not have lecture slides four and five. Can someone send them? I guess they will. I don't see any other kinds of specific chats. So uh, I haven't gotten to the um, spinocerebellar tracts and I haven't gotten again to the corticospinal tract. So I wanna get to that next week and I'll do that. Uh, they'll, they'll happen in pretty short order. As you can see, them changing my course from neuroanatomy to systems neuroscience, an awful lot of additional information gets sort of loaded on. So the point of the matter is, I do not, uh, next week is the week of the 28th. And then I guess uh, whatever the following week is, the week of the fifth, that is where I think I'd start thinking about giving an exam. Now, my first exam is basically covering the gross neuroanatomy, superior, lateral, inferior, medial portions of the brain, then the ventricular system, then the blood supply, and then the spinal cord organization and the spinal cord projection systems 
which is why I want to be able to finish all of those uh, things. Now, as I pointed out in the syllabus, a typical way for me to give this exam, if we were all in person, is I'd have you come in and at 9.15, I'd start part one of the exam. And it would probably take uh, about 20, 25 minutes, okay? Because I answer 40 identification the questions. I point at something and then you, answer, uh, you write it down. And then I grade you. Then the second part of the exam, which is worth about 60%, are so-called essays. But when I talk about essays, very often they all list this, list that. And of course, when we were, we were not, uh, uh, we were in person, people would walk in, there'd be no books open, nothing, and you would just generate things. The world has changed. The world has changed in a remarkable kind of way. Let me sort of show you this because my wife very, very uh, wonderfully uh, demonstrated um, demonstrated uh, the issues, okay? She found a couple of things here. Let me just see, uh, let me see if this is, let me see what this is. Oh, darn it. 